Welcome to Radiology Case Review, Uterine Adenomyosis. I'm Dr. Dan Koval from Radiologist Headquarters. This episode is sponsored by Samsung Ultrasound. The beautiful images that you're about to see were obtained on a Samsung RS85 Prestige Ultrasound Unit. I have three unique cases to show you and I'll review key teaching points throughout. Let's start with some definitions. So adenomyosis occurs when ectopic endometrial tissue, glands, and stroma deposit in the myometrium. This leads to dysfunctional smooth muscle hyperplasia and hypertrophy surrounding these ectopic glands. The cause is unknown, but it's fairly common. It's usually seen in multiparous women of reproductive age, multiparous meaning women that have had more than one child. Other risk factors include early menarche, short menstrual cycles, and patients with high body mass index, as these are traits associated with high estrogen exposure. Because of that, it's rarely seen in postmenopausal patients unless they've been treated with tamoxifen for breast cancer. Adenomyosis is often asymptomatic, but it can present with menorrhagia, which is abnormally heavy bleeding at menstruation, dysmenorrhea, which is painful menstruation, dyspareunia, which is painful intercourse, and also chronic pelvic pain. All right, let's move on to case number one. This was a 40-year-old female patient, and we're starting with a sagittal image of the uterus on transvaginal imaging. So here's the uterine fundus, and it's very globular, and notice how heterogeneous the myometrial architecture is here. This is the echogenic endometrial stripe, and the margins with the surrounding myometrium are very ill-defined. Moving to the left of the uterus, you can see that there are these areas of pencil-thin posterior acoustic shadowing diffusely throughout the myometrium. When we move to the transverse imaging, we see that pencil-thin shadowing much better, and then we also see the ill-defined lobular margins of the endometrium here. Notice how there's an elongated striation with a nodular tip here. It almost looks like a lollipop extending out into the myometrium, very ill-defined like a island of endometrium, but it's out here in the myometrium. And we see this heterogeneous myometrial architecture surrounding it. As we continue to look at transverse imaging, you see these ill-defined nodular striations, and then this one terminates as a small subendometrial cyst. Here it is on sagittal imaging with the surrounding myometrial heterogeneity. Now let's take a look at the transverse cine clip, which gives us an overview of all these findings as if we're scanning in real time. Notice how well we can see that ill-defined margination of the endometrial stripe as it insinuates into the myometrium, and then these small subendometrial cysts here. As I scroll further, you can see the irregular echogenic striations extending out into the biometrium. As we get closer to the fundus, it's just diffusely heterogeneous. These pencil-thin posterior acoustic shadows really stand out. And you can also notice some small myometrial cysts. Now the patient did also have transabdominal imaging and you can see the uterus here with the endometrial stripe, but notice how it's much more difficult to make the diagnosis of adenomyosis with transabdominal imaging. We can see that the contour is a bit bulky and globular, but we can't really see that myometrial heterogeneity quite as clearly. You might get a sense that there is some irregularity of the endometrial myometrial interface here, particularly on this transabdominal image, but it's very hard to make the diagnosis on transabdominal imaging alone. We do see that the uterus is enlarged with a volume of 215 cc's. The upper limits of normal is about 120 cc's. All right, let's review key points for that case. So for diagnosing adenomyosis, transvaginal ultrasound is much more sensitive and specific, about 89% compared with transabdominal imaging. And the two most specific ultrasound findings to make this diagnosis include these linear echogenic striations or nodules that radiate out from the endometrium into that inner myometrium. And the other finding is the presence of these tiny myometrial and subendometrial cysts that corresponds to the fluid-filled ectopic glands. But additional findings you may see on ultrasound include this enlarged globular shape to the uterus with just a diffuse myometrial bulkiness, as well as diffuse myometrial heterogeneity. And then an irregular endometrial myometrial interface is typical, and you might see these little hyperchoic islands of ectopic endometrial tissue. And finally, that pencil-thin shadowing often described as Venetian blind or even rain shower shadowing is typical. All right, case two, this was a 47-year-old female, and we're starting with transabdominal imaging. Notice how, again, the uterine fundus and body are enlarged and globular with diffuse heterogeneity on sagittal image, also on transverse image, and we have an enlarged uterus with a volume of 253 cc's. Now, if we look at sagittal transvaginal imaging, we see, again, this diffuse heterogeneity throughout the uterus. We see a small amount of fluid in the endometrial cavity there, but then we lose the endometrial stripe. It just becomes ill-defined. And here we see some pencil-thin shadowing there as we move through the uterus. This heterogeneous thickening appears asymmetric, and it's involving mainly the anterior aspect of the fundus and body. Now, notice how we're starting to see some myometrial cysts throughout the uterine body and fundus here. 
as we move to transverse imaging, we see a diffuse heterogeneity. We still don't see a clearly defined endometrial myometrial interface, but we do see a few more of these little cysts scattered throughout. Now, in this case, we're looking at a sagittal cine clip, and once again, it really shows the architecture of the adenomyosis quite exquisitely, and see that it is somewhat ellipsoid in configuration here with this asymmetric thickening at the anterior uterine body and fundus, and all those numerous little myometrial cysts really stand out, scanning in real time. Now, when we add color Doppler imaging, we see some irregular tortuous flow in that area of adenomyosis, also seen on power Doppler. And that really stands out when we switch to microvascular flow imaging. And that's a great way to look at slow flow in small vessels. You see this tortuous flow extending through the area as opposed to being displaced by it. And that's typical for adenomyosis. So let's review key points for case number two. So as we saw, adenomyosis can cause asymmetric myometrial thickening. And when it's focal, it's known as an adenomyoma. It will typically have ill-defined margins compared to fibroids and will be elliptical in shape as opposed to rounded. And adenomyosis will sometimes have abnormal vascular flow. You might see increased vascularity with these tortuous vessels penetrating the myometrium. That by itself is a secondary feature compared to the ones we've already discussed, but it can actually be quite helpful to differentiate adenomyosis from fibroids because fibroids will tend to displace vessels and if anything will show circumferential flow. So that can be quite helpful. And then just some technical tips as I've been emphasizing, cine clips are extremely helpful when you can see that in real time. Also, if you switch to the penetration setting on your ultrasound machine, that might also further delineate the myometrial cyst. All right, let's look at the final case, case number three, and this also has an MRI example. Now, here we're starting with a sagittal transvaginal image of the uterus, and although the uterus isn't as enlarged as the other cases of adenomyosis we've seen, we do notice that there are these linear echogenic striations extending from the endometrium into the myometrium. But then what's this hypoechoic band-like structure surrounding the endometrium? Well, that's the junctional zone, and these ectopic glands are insinuating into that junctional zone. Again, you can see the endometrial stripe is ill-defined, the margins with the myometrium, particularly at the level of this junctional zone, the inner myometrium. And the same appearance is seen on the transverse imaging here. There's the junctional zone, this hypoechoic area, and then notice the endometrium here with the echogenic linear and nodular striations insinuating out into the myometrium, these tendrils of echogenicity. And as we review the sagittal cine clip, we get a great look at all these linear tendrils of echogenicity extending out into the myometrium. Here's one there. It has a corkscrew shape. We see a few additional areas, all these little echogenic striations. So just another example of how useful these sagittal cine clips can be. And sometimes you'll see the adenomyosis better on one imaging plane than the other. In this case, I think the transverse cine clip shows it much more sharply. There's that myometrial cyst here. And then notice these lobular margins of the endometrium there as I scroll back and forth. It really looks irregular, these nodules and striations extending out into the junctional zone, that hypoechoic area, and the myometrium. So again, I can't emphasize enough how useful the cine clips are or real-time imaging. Now here's the MRI for that patient. We have T2 sagittal and coronal images. There's the urinary bladder where fluid in the bladder will be bright on T2-weighted images. Here's the uterine fundus, the uterine body, and then the lower uterine segment and the cervical region, endocervical canal continuing into the endometrium. And this dark area there, that's the thickened junctional zone. When the junctional zone exceeds 12 millimeters in thickness, that's quite specific for adenomyosis. In this case, it reached 13 millimeters. All right, some key points for the final case. So an ultrasound, although we don't often see it, the thickened junctional zone may manifest as a hypoechoic halo surrounding that echogenic endometrium. And MRI has traditionally been the modality of choice to diagnose adenomyosis. However, modern transvaginal ultrasound shows comparable accuracy to MRI, and studies have even shown that there's no statistical significance between sensitivities and specificities of transvaginal ultrasound and MRI to make this diagnosis. In fact, in this excellent article below by Drs. Cunningham, Harrow, and Smith, they state transvaginal ultrasound should be considered the primary imaging modality for the diagnosis of adenomyosis because it's so effective as well as safe, widely available with lower cost relative to MRI. The key finding on MRI is that junctional zone thickening, if it reaches 12 millimeters or greater, that's highly specific for adenomyosis. You may also find punctate T2 hyperintense cystic foci or T1 hyperintense areas of hemorrhage within that junctional zone thickening corresponding to those ectopic glands, and that adds specificity to the diagnosis. So treatment is mainly aimed at pain management, managing menorrhagia, and then hormonal therapy, including GnRH agonists. For patients that have severe adenomyosis that's not relieved medically, and if the patient has no desire for fertility, hysterectomy may be considered. 
Also, uterine artery embolization has been increasingly used to treat adenomyosis with promising results. Thank you very much for joining me, and thank you again to our sponsor, Samsung Ultrasound. If you like this lecture, please subscribe to the video podcast or on YouTube. To see bonus teaching material posted throughout the week, click the YouTube community tab or follow us on social media. Until next time, radiology is life. <laughs>